Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for those uh, kind words, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come back. I was here, yeah, how long ago? Six months ago. So it's uh, it's a treat to be invited back. Um, Paul asked me what I wanted to talk about, and uh, and I used to talk about coronary disease now. Uh, so it's sort of nice to uh, look at aortic stenosis uh, again. Um, obviously, the most uh, common fatal or potentially fatal heart disease is coronary disease. I guess uh, hypertension, uh, since we have 60 million people with systemic hypertension in this country, it is way up there. But I would put number two, uh, aortic valve stenosis, uh, as uh, number two diagnosis in cardiovascular disease, at least at the hospital where I am. Um, as a potentially fatal or uh, non or, or fatal uh, uh, disease, uh, we I still see two or three patients, unfortunately, that, that uh, come to necropsy every year with aortic stenosis, and nobody made the diagnosis. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a patient who had come into the hospital, and he was a little dizzy, so he ended up seeing the uh, vascular surgeons and uh, had a Doppler in the neck, and uh, it was a little narrowed coronary artery, so he had a, a, car, a carotid endarterectomy, and then he uh, rested two hours later in the recovery room, and he had probably the tightest aortic valve stenosis I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so there are cases like that that I think slip in uh, to, to a lot of hospitals uh, every day and every year, and although in general the diagnosis is relatively simple clinically, uh, it doesn't always work out that way. But it's a terrible diagnosis to miss uh, because obviously there's something that can be done about it. Well, these are the various um, types of aortic stenosis. Uh, uh, if somebody asked me, well, what what's the worst heart disease you can have? Obviously the hundred different heart diseases. Well, number one is uh, aortic valve atresia. Um, aortic valve, and what do you mean by worst heart disease? Uh, well, that's the disease uh, most, uh, uh, that has the shortest longevity. Uh, if some a child, newborn, is quite short of breath and heart's a little big and they don't live uh, 48 hours, you can bet your bottom dollar it's aortic valve atresia. It's so, uh, it's it's a terrible thing to have. I think the only operation, if you're going to do it, is a transplant. Uh, my, that's a personal view. Uh, supravalvular aortic stenosis, extremely uncommon, very very rare. Discrete subvalvular stenosis here. Uh, that's missed too. But usually that's not apparent until adulthood. Uh, if you're going to have aortic stenosis. Uh, this is probably the best one to have, uh, uh, although uh, the jet hits these aortic valve cusps. It's only, the narrowing is only about a centimeter below the valve. So what happens here, commonly these patients have infection on that valve, but no aortic regurgitation develops because the regurgitant jet can't get through that uh, discrete uh, stenosis. So here's a situation where the aortic valve can get totally destroyed and there's no aortic regurgitation uh, to speak of. So that diagnosis can be um, a bit tricky. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is uh, valvular uh, aortic stenosis and primarily in adulthood. Maybe we can turn these lights off up here and keep those on by I think these slides will show up better. The aortic valve is remarkable. Now, what allows the aortic valve to open? Well, uh, the distance between each of the three commissures is, is usually the same. Uh, there, there can be a, a bit of variation there, but the thing that allows it to open is that the distance between any two commissures is greater than a straight line. So because it's greater than a straight line, that cusp can come back uh, toward the wall uh, during ventricular systole. Now, what allows a bicuspid valve to open? Uh, there you don't have 
greater than a straight line, or theoretically you don't, greater than a straight line distance between two comma shears. Uh, I'll try to come back to that. Aortic stenosis uh, compared to aortic regurgitation or, 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 or regurgitation at any valve, regurgitation is a far more complex problem than is, than is stenosis. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there are only three causes of, of aortic valve stenosis, and I would list them now as, uh, uh, well, I guess, this is, a this is an old slide. Degenerative is, is not the problem. I call it atherosclerotic now. Uh, so I would say atherosclerosis is the most common cause of, of aortic stenosis. Number two is a congenital malformation, mainly a bicuspid valve. And third uh, is rheumatic heart disease. And most, everybody with that I call rheumatic, it depends how you define rheumatic. I bet if we went around this room, everybody's definition of rheumatic heart disease would be different. Uh, I define rheumatic heart disease as a disease, at least anatomically, of the mitral valve. Uh, that doesn't mean it causes that valve to always function abnormally, uh, but um, uh, if it, uh, it also, of course, can involve any other valve, but if it uh, involves aortic or tricuspid or any other, the mitral valve is always diffusely fibrotic. Uh, uh, but, but rheumatic uh, aortic stenosis obviously is pretty infrequent today. Now this is data that uh, I collected when I was at NIH. I used to get these uh, hearts from all over the city. I went to 12 hospitals a month. Uh, I was sort of a collector, I'm afraid. But these are uh, a thousand, uh, ten cases. Yeah, that's better, thank you. Um, uh, and these were collected from 1960 to 1980. Uh, and this was the heyday of valve replacement. I mean, when valve surgery started in 1960, I mean, good valve surgery. It started where I was in 1962. Uh, there was a there were a huge number of people that, around the country that needed valves, new valves, and um, so when surgery started, uh, there were a few complications, and it's not like today. Uh, so not all of these patients have made it. But my purpose of showing this is that aortic stenosis led to this. Uh, that's by far the most common fatal or potentially fatal valve disease. Now at this time, mitral stenosis was second. Uh, we're still seeing mitral stenosis in Texas a good bit, but uh, not so much uh, in other parts, I think. The combination of mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis is a bad, is a bad lesion. Uh, then pure regurgitation and pure mitral regurgitation, and I call it pure that is no element of stenosis. When I was at NIH, patients with bowel disease were classified as predominant stenosis, predominant regurgitation. I've never liked that because the etiology of pure regurgitation is totally different uh, as a rule than the etiology of stenotic valves. Um, and then combination, where you have one valve stenotic and one regurgitant is relatively uncommon. If, if there are two valves involved on the left side of the heart, both tend to be stenotic or both tend to be purely regurgitant. It's sort of unusual to have one stenotic and one regurgitant. We've looked at uh, the patients having double valve replacement where I am now in Baylor. And, and, and I must admit that, that I think the indications, particularly for double valve re replacement, uh, compared to 20 years ago, um, has changed remarkably. Uh, same with with isolated valve replacement. Uh, when I, I grew up on the Bronwall and Morrow at NIH, and if you didn't have a peak systolic gradient greater than 50, you weren't considered. I'm, I'm talking about without uh, much regurgitation. You weren't considered for valve replacement. Uh, today, particularly with associated coronary bypass, patients are having aortic valve replacement in my institution with peak systolic gradients 20, 22, 23, 
And uh, I think that's justified if you're going to have associated bypass. On the other hand, we have some of those patients roll through now who get uh, aortic valve replacement when peak systolic radius are 20, 18, 22. And um, uh, it, I think it's a problem. Uh, I look at those valves, and some of them are quite flexible. Uh, when I grew up, I've looked at valves for 30 years, and I can look at a valve and predict pretty well, I think, what the peak systolic gradient is across that valve. Now, I cannot predict valve area at all. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm an anti-valve area person. Uh, gradients which are relatively small, like peak systolic gradients, 17, 18, 20, 22, the valve area can be quite small sometimes, uh, but uh, I think it's the formula, it's the calculation. Uh, so I stick with valve area, I mean with peak systolic gradient. I don't even care to know uh, what the valve or area is. And, uh, and, and that, that view uh, is from looking at valves for years, knowing the hemodynamic data. When I was at NIH, uh, Every patient was presented at a conference, and the, I used to write down the cath data, and the next week I'd see the valve. Uh, so you know, I've looked at valves through the years, and the same thing happens now. Uh, I, I look at the valve knowing how that valve functioned. Now, there are many reasons why a congenitally malformed valve doesn't work uh, properly or can not work properly. Uh, the number of cusps, one can have a three-cuspid valve, I think, and still be congenitally malformed uh, if the cusps are, are different in size. Uh, sometimes the size of the aortic root is very important, the thickness of the cusp and whether the cusps are fused. Uh, the unicuspid valve is, is the least common in the aortic valve position. Usually in the aortic valve position, if there's only one cusp, that means one commissure, you go all the way around, come back, no other lateral attachments to the wall of the aorta. In the pulmonic position, the uh, simple dome, where the orifice is in the center of the valve, uh, no real good commissures um, uh, is the most common. Well, this is a unicuspid valve. This lady was uh, 71 years old. Uh, the peak systolic gradient across that valve was 109. Today, I rarely see a valve with a peak systolic gradient over 100. Uh, I used to see that all the time. Um, when I see a peak systolic gradient 70 or 60 now, I think I, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I've got some data through the years uh, at NIH, uh, operatively excised aortic valves, and the peak systolic gradient was up here. And then I used to see all the operatively excised valves at Georgetown and uh, the peak systolic gradient average down here. And now, where I am now at Baylor, and I think it's a very fine place. This is happening around the country. Now the peak systolic gradient average is way down here, even when the bypass cases are, are eliminated from that. And one of the uh, institutions pushing early valve replacement and I think you can do that maybe in pure regurgitation, but I don't see any logic for doing it in aortic stenosis. The Mayo Clinic you know, is now saying we, we, all, we operate too late. We need to operate earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an advocate uh, of that. Uh, the bicuspid valve is historically a very interesting valve. Uh, Peacock, I think, in about 1850 or so, started talking about the bicuspid valve. And William Osler, uh, in 1885, really put the bicuspid valve on the map. Uh, uh, William Osler did about a thousand autopsies himself. And he uh, was quite interested in the bicuspid valve, and he pointed out the propensity of this valve, be, valve being the site of infective endocarditis. That was a famous paper, Malignant Endocarditis in 1885, uh, which is, uh, clearly the case, um, if you have a bicuspid valve, if you're considering opiate addiction, for example, make sure you get a good precordial examination beforehand. Uh, uh, because if you've got a bicuspid valve, and possibly one of us in this room has a bicuspid aortic valve, you do not want to be an intravenous drug addict. Uh, 
Um, I used to, when I was in Washington, I, I went to the D.C. medical examiner's office. Every month, I'd see a bicuspid valve uh, with infection, and almost always it was an opiate addict. But the, clearly these valves uh, can be uh, the site of infective uh, uh, endocarditis, and that was William Osler's great contribution to this particular entity. Well, uh, Osler missed entirely that the aortic valve uh, could be stenotic. Now, why did Osler miss that? Well, um, I don't know the answer for that for sure, but Friesinger in uh, Nashville has uh, speculated that in 1900, 1890, the average age of death of men in this country, I believe, was about 50. So he speculated, well, it, it, they just didn't live as long as, as today. Uh, and uh, it, took, it takes time to put calcium there. Interestingly, uh, it was not until 1978 that it was pointed out the extreme that, that these bicuspid valves can be purely regurgitant. I mean, regurgitant enough to have to replace the valve uh, without uh, that regurgitation being due to infective endocarditis. Um, now, there's some people who go through life with a bicuspid valve and nothing happens to them. Um, that valve never gets stenotic, it never gets uh, purely regurgitant, it, it never gets um, infected. And uh, I've been trying to figure that out uh, for years. Uh, the oldest bicuspid valve I've seen is 92 years old. Uh, my son, who's a cardiovascular surgeon, uh, told me he operated on a patient a while back who was 96 years old and had a bicuspid valve. Uh, we're now seeing at Baylor, where I am, more aortic stenosis due to a bicuspid valve than in a three-cuspid valve, irrespective of age. There are two basic types uh, one is where the cusps are right and left, and if that's the situation, a raphe is always in the right cusp. Uh, so one coronary comes off uh, behind each cusp. The other is when the cusps are anterior and posterior. Here, if a raphe is present, it's always in the anterior cusp. There are no exceptions uh, to that. And in my experience, about half patients have this, and other half have that. <coughs> This is a bicuspid valve. This happened to be a, a physician uh, who was 61. Uh, this is a raphe here. Uh, one true commissure, another one severe valve. Now this is what I hate to see at autopsy. There's no reason to ever see this at autopsy. Uh, uh, I, I like seeing operatively excised aortic valves, but this fellow needed a valve replacement. He didn't need an autopsy. Here's another one. Um, this is a bicuspid valve, right and left cusp. Uh, this true commissure is fused a bit, so functionally it's like a unicuspid valve, but that's, that's clearly a bicuspid valve. And here's a three-cuspid valve. Uh, I used to say this was more common in patients over 65, and that was my experience until I came to Baylor. And now, no question, the bicuspid valve is, 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 uh, is the most common, irrespective uh, of age. Uh, in the three-cuspid valve, at least in older people, there's usually no commissural fusion at all, none. So these three cusps come back together normally. So I don't care how much you lean them over and try to hear aortic regurgitation, uh, usually that's not the case. If you hear aortic regurgitation in an older person with aortic stenosis, it's most likely to be a bicuspid valve. Here the calcium is deposited on the ventricular, on, on the aortic aspects of these cusps. There's very little on the ventricular aspect. Now, what produces aortic stenosis in the three-cuspid aortic valve? Uh, well, I used to say degenerative, with the implication that if we live long enough, we'll get calcium in the aortic valve. But I've switched that now to say that this is an atherosclerotic lesion. Apparently, in societies where total cholesterols and LDLs are less than 100, Aortic stenosis on a three-cuspid aortic valve, except when it's rheumatic, uh, is, is extremely uncommon. So I, I think this is a this is atherosclerosis. Uh, this is a valve that in a patient that had a uh, transcatheter 
uh, valvulotomy and it came back together here. But that turned out to be a disastrous procedure. I mean, these, these valves are too rock hard. These are three patients that, that when I was at NIH that died after having a, a trans percutaneous aortic valvuloplasty. Uh, the peak systolic gradients were pretty high before operation. Uh, they were lower after operation, but uh, they didn't last too long. Yes? Can you uh, always distinguish three situses in the bicuspid valves, Bill? Or does it just look like, you know, two, two? Uh, yeah. You know, angiographically, you see three, and, and what's it look like uh, pathologically? Well, sometimes the, uh, the raphe is, uh, uh, I wouldn't say always on any of this, but uh, uh, here, you know, if you've got a huge amount of calcium there, it also throws you off a bit. Uh, uh, bicuspid valves, uh, there's no way that you can get uh, three sinuses out of that one. Um, I think it's hard to get three sinuses out of this one, although that's a raphe, so that separates this a little bit from that one. But uh, uh, I don't think that's a major problem. Uh, if the mitral valve, Clinically, if the mitral valve is entirely normal, uh, you better bet on a bicuspid valve. Uh, it's much better to bet on a bicuspid valve uh, than a um, uh, than a tricuspid. Now, this is a situation of rheumatic heart disease. Here, the aortic valve, uh, this commercial fusion. Here, here, here. It's really. How do you define commissure of the aortic valve? Well, really, it's a space. Uh, so it's not fusion of commissures, it's fusion of cusp near the sites of commissures. But when three commissures are fused, or if two are fused, you, you better bet on rheumatic disease, and you better look at that mitral valve. Now, here's the mitral valve, and the severely stenotic, uh, and this one's quite stenotic as well. These are these little, uh, what you call them now, probably contact lesions. Uh, now, why does a mitral valve uh, become calcified? Well, nobody knows the answer to that, but it's my understanding uh, from talking to John Barlow in South Africa, for example, that, that in the black population in South Africa, where the cholesterol levels are quite a bit lower than in the white population there, uh, calcium in a mitral valve, stenotic one, is very uncommon. So it may be that calcium in any valve uh, is cholesterol dependent, even a bicuspid valve. Well, this is, uh, uh, this is one of the last things I did in NIH. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, all of the necropsy cases of aortic stenosis uh, that I had seen in a 30 plus year period up there. And these were the unicuspid valves. These, this is autopsy now, not, not valve replacement. This is the thing you don't want to see. Uh, uh, unicuspid valves, bicuspid valves, and tricuspid valves. There's some evidence that a unicuspid valve is stenotic from the time of birth. And so the average age here was younger. The bicuspid valve, there's no good evidence that it's stenotic from the time of birth. It appears to get stenotic only as it gets calcified. So the difference in ages here, 62 and the tricuspid valve, 64, uh, were no different, essentially. Now, the, the aortic valve uh, is more, whether it's pure regurgitation or whether it's stenosis, is more common in the, in the men than, than, than in the women. Uh, uh, here, 94% of these unicuspid valves were or boys or men, men, uh, bicuspid men, nearly 75%, and the tricuspid more common uh, in men. Uh, symptomatic, uh, most of them were symptomatic. We didn't have enough total cholesterols here to, to, to make that meaningful. We had the fewest uh, here. Uh, that was quite different than what I expected. I think it's purely a machine. Sudden death is, uh, is pretty uncommon, and a lot of these sudden death patients, they had a good bit of coronary uh, disease as well. Calcium, 
uh, in open population, uh, particularly is 53% of fowls, much less. Uh, if you look at men versus uh, uh, women, uh, the women are older, uh, just like coronary disease. Uh, this is about the average age of death in men with coronary disease. This is the average age of death in women with coronary disease, and the same with aortic uh, valve disease. Uh, I, I don't quite understand that. That's a freak because of lack of numbers. Heart weights are always different in men and women. You know, if, if you group them, 610 gram heart's a big heart. Uh, so the, the, this that was a necropsy series. If you look at uh, Bronwall's famous paper on the natural history of aortic stenosis, they had 15 patients. 15 patients. Uh, so, so although this stuff is not perfect, you know, we're talking about 200 patients here uh, seen at uh, necropsy. And of course, in the 15 patients that Bronwall and Frank studied, they, they had cath data on all those patients. These were patients that went, had cath, and then they refused operation and were followed. Uh, but most of the natural history of aortic stenosis is based on those 15 patients. Now, this is... Um, this is something seen in older people in our lipid-laden environs. Well, what is this? This is the circle C mitral annular calcium. All the way around here, come back. That's all posterior mitral leaflet. Posterior mitral leaflet is about two-thirds of the annulus. And in this patient, the calcium came across anterior mitral leaflet. So it's not a, it's not a C or a J, it's an O. Uh, now this is the aortic valve, and here I think one can clearly see that's a three-cuspid valve. That's one commissure, not fused, calcium. Another commissure, calcium in this cusp, no commissural fusion, calcium here. And then this is coronary artery with calcium in it. And if you look at hearts of patients over 65 uh, with, uh, with mitral annular calcium, I've never seen an exception to this. There's always calcium in the coronary arteries. And there's usually also calcium in the aortic valve. So this is what I call the senile cardiac calcification syndrome. This is all atherosclerosis. Mitral annular calcium, in my view, is a, is a um, atherosclerotic uh, lesion. And they often go together here. <coughs> Now, how does calcium in the mitral annulus come about? I think if all of us in this room picked up our posterior mitral leaflet, we'd see some uh, lipid deposits on there. And if we looked at our aortic valve, we'd see lipid deposits on the uh, aortic uh, aspect. And those lipid deposits apparently can outgrow the blood supply to them, and then that's when they become uh, uh, calcified. There's also lipid deposits on anterior a leaflet, but blood continues here. It doesn't pack it in. It doesn't have anywhere else to go. Now, this is a, a man uh, who had lipid deposits all over his body. See that? Uh, here, here, his tendons here. Very. Look at his elbows, ankles. This is his buttocks. All these are lipid lesions. Now this patient had homozygous familial hypertension. This occurs in uh, about one out of a million people, so we only have 273 of them uh, in this country. Uh, most of these individuals die on a natural history basis, age 13 or 14. Uh, they have total cholesterol levels greater than 800. Now why am I showing this? I'm showing it because most of these familial hypercholesterolemic patients uh, develop aortic stenosis. And what you see in these aortic valve cusps here, uh, which become very thickened, very calcified, and those valves become stenotic. And this is atherosclerosis uh, in some of these patients with extremely high cholesterol levels. The other thing that's interesting about the familial homozygous, or, or another interesting thing, is that they have the reversal of atherosclerosis in the aorta. They get more plaques in ascending aorta than in abdominal aorta, just the opposite uh, of uh, older people. 
So this is a bit of evidence, in my view, that if our cholesterol levels are high enough, we get aortic stenosis from that alone, and the higher the level, the earlier it occurs. This is uh, my experience, gosh, this was up, this was in the 1970s, with, a, with bicuspid aortic valves at autopsy. And uh, look, 157 out of 200 were, were stenotic. Uh, uh, and 97% of them had calcium in the aortic valve. Some people, I asked a, a famous person one time, I said, what, what's the etiology of aortic stenosis in most of the patients you operate on? He said, calcific. Well, that doesn't help. Every, every stenotic valve, almost, is calcified, rheumatic, degenerative, or, or atherosclerotic, bicuspid, any of them. Uh, so, so the presence of calcium doesn't help. Uh, if it's non-calcified, uh, that's a pretty unusual uh, valve. This is aortic dissection here, four out of uh, 157. Um, patients with bicuspid valves have about five times the frequency of aortic dissection than in patients with tricuspid valves. Uh, their aorta, is, ascending aorta, tends not to be uh, a normal. And that's why I think it's so dilated. It's very unusual to dilate a three-cuspid, to dilate the ascending aorta in a three-cuspid valve, but a bicuspid, you can expect it. Um, a coarctation of the aorta, C of A, that was seven out of 157 patients. So the two uh, tend to go together. If you, if you ask the question in a patient with bicuspid aortic valve, what are the chances of having coarctation of the aorta? It's not very good. It's, uh, it's certainly less than 5%. If, on the other hand, you take 100 patients with coarctation of the aorta, how many have a bicuspid valve? And the answer is probably about 80%. A pure regurgitation, no, no element of, of, uh, of stenosis. 19 of the 22 had infective endocarditis. And then at the same time, there were 21 patients with bicuspid valves at autopsy and they died from other conditions, cancer and so on. These were incidental autopsy findings. A uh, valve had functioned entirely normally uh, during life. 75% uh, of the patients with bicuspid valve were men. On the other hand, anybody that presents with mitral disease, isolated mitral disease, mitral valve prolapse, uh, stenosis, tend to be, um, tend to be women. The mitral valve is far more common in women than in men. It's interesting that mitral valve prolapse, although more common in women, those who develop enough mitral regurgitation to warrant operation are usually men. Uh, the reason for that, I don't know, but it's important. You can tell a woman, you know, your chances of developing severe mitral regurgitation are, uh, are not very good. In a man, uh, it's, it's higher. Now this is very old data here. Uh, this is from Maud Abbott, and this is a paper by uh, Sam Levine uh, right after World War II. And, and they took patients with, uh, with coarctation of the aorta and, and asked how many had bicuspid valves. 22%, uh, uh, 27%, 62%. Jesse Edwards found about 75%. Uh, percent. What about aortic dissection? rupture and, and look at that 45 percent 42 percent today it's uh, dissection with a bicuspid valve is not seen very much a rupture of aorta is not seen very much these patients are operated on uh, but but on a natural history basis uh, victor mccusick years ago said well if if bicuspid valve and coarctation commonly go together maybe the wall of the aorta between the valve and the aortic isthmus uh, is not normal. And he was clearly right. If you look at these uh, walls of aorta in patients with bicuspid valves, uh, often the number of elastic fibers there is, is less than normal, or they're, they're a bit frayed. But these people do tend to have more dilated aortas uh, than patients with tricuspid valves, even with the same gradient. Um, 
another thing of uh, uh, interruption of the aortic arch so that you have ascending aorta giving off the arch arteries and then the, uh, the uh, descending aorta comes out of the pulmonary trunk via the ductus arteriosus. So this is complete interruption of the aorta and 100% of these patients have a bicuspid valve. Uh, there's no exception uh, to that. So coarctation may be 75%, this is 100%. Uh, now, what about operatively excised valves? Uh, this is what I see mainly, mainly today. I still look at all the valves uh, excised at my institution. It's very helpful to do that. I learn a lot from it. Uh, and then I know what's going on in the hospital. I can, I can talk to the surgeons and cardiologists more intelligently about these things. This is what I would call a unicuspid valve. Uh, one true commissure, you go all the way around, come back, no other lateral attachments. That valve is probably stenotic from the time of birth. This is a bicuspid valve, quite a bit of uh, calcium uh, here. This is a tricuspid valve, a little fusion here, maybe a little there, uh, no, none up here. Well, uh, if I had a steno uh, aortic stenosis or a bicuspid valve, or congenitally malformed valve, or if I had mitral stenosis, I would be, I would definitely be on a, uh, a statin drug, and I'd also be on aspirin tablets. Uh, I, I think that, the, the, particularly on the mitral valve, that valve gets thickened, in my opinion, because of deposits of, of fibrin platelets on it. And if we can keep the blood thin and, and the cholesterol levels down, potentially can help. But there are going to be some answers to that question. Thank you, Thanks, everyone, for coming.